Hey guys, today I'm going to be doing a full length step by step tutorial of this toucan using pan pastels with a few Stabilo Carbothello pastel pencils for the finer details. Over the last few months I've been working with pan pastel to create my own selection of colours that I love to use in my own artwork. So I create things like wildlife art, pet portraits, florals, landscapes, human portraits and still life. So this set is called the General Realism set with Kirsty Rebecca. So the way that I usually work with pan pastel is that I use a light layer as an underpainting and I usually do my backgrounds in pan pastel as well. And then I come through with a few layers of pastel pencils over the top of that. But you can actually use pan pastel fully for the entire painting if you want to. It's just gonna be a little bit more expressive or if you work slightly larger, you'll be able to get a little bit more of those details in there. But usually I use pastel pencils for the last few layers to get those final details. So for this project of the toucan, I'm actually going to use pan pastel for the majority of the piece. And then I'm just going to come through with those tiny little details at the end with those pastel pencils. So I'm only going to be using minimal pencil for this and mostly pan pastel to show you how you can use them for pretty much an entire piece of artwork. And if you did want to see how I usually work with them using a light layer for an underpainting, I do have a lot of other tutorials on my YouTube channel where you can check that out. But in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to use the pan pastels and how you can create some beautiful artwork using this set. If you want to follow along with me for this piece, I do have the reference photo and a traceable outline and a couple of other attachments that might be useful for you over on my Patreon channel. So you don't actually have to be a member to access this. So I'll just leave a link in the description. All you need to do is click on that and you'll be able to download those attachments for free. And you'll also find a list of all of the supplies that I'm using as well. So I'm just going to run through those supplies that I'm using for this project here. So I've got my set of pan pastels to the side here and I'm actually working on Claire Fontaine pastel mat as my surface. So this color is the brown and I like to use the mid-tone colors so like sienna, brown, dark gray, any of those kinds of colors will work just fine. I just like to use the mid-tone rather than white just because it's a little bit easier for me to add darks and lights on top of that, but it's personal preference. You can use whatever color you like for this because we're gonna be covering the whole piece anyway. And the paper that you're working on makes a huge difference as well. So I really highly recommend getting the pastel mat if you haven't tried using pastels before. It really makes a huge difference even if it is a little bit more expensive. So I'm going to be applying the pan pastel using some soft tools and that's S-O-F-F-T. So there's a few different types of tools that you can use. You can get these blue knives that have these little tiny covers that you can put over the top of them. And they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes as well. So if you do purchase this set, it does come with a few different soft tools that I like to use with my artwork as well. But they also have these larger sort of sponges for bigger areas and also these kind of little eyeshadow looking tools as well. So there's all different sizes and shapes for different effects and things as well. So for some of the finer details, I'm using these Stabilo Carbothello pastel pencils and I like to use these or the Faber-Castell Pit Pastel Pencils. So whichever brand you have is fine. The Derwent Pastel Pencils are pretty good as well. And then I've just taped my work down using some scotch tape. And that's just so that there's a bit of a clean border around the outside to hold on to. It makes it a bit easier to frame and it keeps the artwork still while you're working as well. And then I usually keep some paper towel to the side and that's to wipe off the excess pastel from my tool between colours if I need to. So that's everything guys, let's get into it. All right, so in the top right hand corner, I've just got a photo of my finished artwork just so that you can see what I'm doing throughout the process. Okay, so I've got my outline down on my pastel mat using some pastel pencil. And if you're not sure how to get your outline down on this kind of paper, an easy way is to print out your reference photo or traceable outline, or if you want to freehand it, do that on a separate piece of paper that's the same size as what you want your project to be. And then grab that printout or your drawing, turn it over, and then apply some pan pastel on the back of it. So just rub some white pan pastel or whatever color you prefer over the back of your drawing or your printout. 
covering all of the lines that you've done. And then when you turn it back over the right way up, put that on top of your pastel mat and then trace over those lines and the pastel from the back of your drawing or your printout will then imprint onto your pastel mat. So that's an easy way to get your outline down if you're not sure how to do that. So I'm going to start with the background first and I'm taking some of the permanent green extra dark as well as some of the chromium oxide green. So I'm using the slightly larger sponge here and I've just picked up a little bit of that darker green and the medium green from the pans. So I've just gone into both pans straight after each other and picked up a little bit of both of those greens. So for the background of this piece I'm going to have a few different kinds of greens and blues and then probably towards the end I'll add in some of those reds and things as well. So when I'm applying the pastel to the surface, I'm sort of doing almost crisscross random sort of strokes and picking up different amounts of the different greens just to give it a little bit more variation. So when you come into your paper for the first time with the pastel, you'll notice that it comes off of your tool quite a lot on the first stroke. And then as you do a couple more strokes, it does uh, fade a little bit as in there's less pastel coming off of your tool after the first couple of strokes. And so when this happens, all you need to do is come back into your pan and get more pastel onto your sponge. So don't try and push harder to get more pastel to come off of the sponge because it's actually going to damage the sponges, especially if you're working on the pastel mat or any of the sanded papers, it can actually wear away your sponge. And those blue knife tools that have the little tiny covers, they wear away really quickly as well. So make sure that you're being really gentle when you're applying the pastel to the surface. And then when the pastel starts to be a little bit thin and not coming off like it is now, just come back in to your pan and get more pastel to apply to the surface. Don't try and push harder to get more to come off. So I'm just continuing to pick up those two different colored greens. And in your first layer of pastel, it can look quite messy like this, quite blotchy, but as you layer more pastel, it becomes smoother and smoother. So you can keep it with a little bit more of those pastel strokes showing through, but you can also blend it to be nice and soft as well. If you continue to layer and add a bit more pastel, it will start to blend out a lot more smoothly as well. So this initial first layer does tend to look a little bit blotchy though. So I'm going to come through to the entire background with these two colours. I'll probably add in some lighter colours as it gets more towards the toucan itself. So when I was deciding on the colours to use for this set of pan pastel, I really wanted to include all of the different colours that I like to use in most of my artwork, but also I wanted to include the five main colours that you need to blend any colour that you want. So I've got a sort of primary red, blue and yellow, which is the permanent red, the Hansa yellow and ultramarine blue. And I've also got black and white. And with those five colours, you can actually mix any colour that you need to. So it makes it really, really easy to actually mix any of the colours that are not already in this set if you want to. So if you found that you need a slightly different kind of green or you need a different kind of purple or orange or whatever, whatever colour you need, you can still make that colour with the colours that are in this set. Then I have included all of the main colours, like the greys and the greens, the dark blues, some more vibrant blue, and there's also a few different shades of brown and also a purple shade as well in this set because I tend to use those colours quite often. So although you can actually mix a lot of these colours using those five base colours, it does tend to get a little bit tedious to continue to mix all of the colours that I use quite often, which is why I've created this set that has all of the colours that I tend to use more often, so that way I don't have to continually mix all of those colours that I use. So I'm also adding some Hansa yellow into the background. So I'm starting to go a little bit lighter towards the toucan itself. And I haven't cleaned off my soft tool at all. So I've still got some of those greens on the tool and that really doesn't matter because the yellow is going to mix in with the greens and just create a more yellow toned green anyway. If you needed to keep your colors separate, 
You can either use a clean tool to come in and pick up your next color or you can use your paper towel and wipe off most of the excess pastel on that paper towel. So I'm just coming back and forth between the green and that Hansi yellow, that chromium oxide green. Okay, so I'm going to take some of the yellow ochre tint and I'm applying this a little bit more towards the toucan. So I found that by applying darker colors around the edges, it sort of brings that attention more towards the center of the piece or the area that you want that attention to be drawn to. So having a lighter center and then darker around the edges tends to draw that eye into the center. So with this tool, I like this one in particular, it's got a little bit of a point to it. So you can get into some of those finer areas by just using the little points on the tool. So you can get right up to that outline of the toucan with just this one tool. And I always like to overlap my outline just slightly. So that way the toucan won't look like it's cut and paste onto the background. Cause sometimes if you, do your pastel up to the outline and then you stop just short of the outline and then you do your toucan. There's this kind of like halo effect that appears around the edge of the toucan. Like it doesn't overlap properly. It doesn't look like the toucan belongs in the background because there's this little sort of gap around the edge of it. So I tend to go over the outline just slightly. And then when I go and do the toucan, I overlap that back over the top of the background so that there's no sort of halo effect around the outside of the bird. So if you're not a member on Patreon, where I have my longer tutorials, just like this one, I always include about four or five different versions of the reference photo as attachments for you to download. So if you've gone over there to download the free attachments for this project, you would have noticed that there's an original reference photo, which is the one that I have found on Pixabay. But then I've also got an edited version, which is the one that I'm mainly using for this project. And then I've also got a traceable outline, which will help you guys be able to start with an accurate outline if you want to. But then I've also got a high saturation version of the reference photo. And this, I'm literally just hyping up those colors to make them super bright. So it makes it a little bit more obvious to see what colors are in what kind of area, because in my artwork, especially for black animals and white animals, I tend to use a lot more exaggerated colors like blues and purples and reds and that kind of thing and I find that by hyping up the saturation on the reference photo it really helps show those sort of hidden colors so I tend to use that quite a lot throughout the base layers and just throughout my project in general and then I've also got another attachment which is the color swatches so this is almost a similar idea I tend to pick out the different colors that are in different areas and I'm just creating a swatch of that color on the side. So it just sort of helps you be able to see exactly what color is in what area. Kind of helps with things like shadows and highlights and that kind of thing to help your mind actually see what that color is. Because sometimes it it's a lot of people just go in with white for highlights and black for shadows or gray or whatever. And it's not usually the case. There's usually other colors in those areas as well. So I do include all of those different reference photos in the tutorials for you to help make the process a little bit easier. Okay, so I'm going to take some of the Thalo Blue Extra Dark and mix that in with the uh, Permanent Green Extra Dark as well. Just add a little bit more blue in there and this will also help create a bit more of a darker colour. So again, I'm just doing random sort of strokes. I'm trying to keep some of those pastel strokes visible. In a lot of my projects, I tend to create a, a more smooth background, but I wanted some of those strokes to show through in this piece to be a little bit more expressive. So if you did want to get a smoother result, one of the ways that I do that is to actually blend the pastel in between each layer. So before adding these sort of darker colors on top, like I'm doing now, you can come through with a cotton tip if you're working on a smaller piece. Um, so you're basically just blending the pastel into the tooth of the paper a little bit more. 
kind of like you would with a blending stump when you're working with charcoal or graphite or something like that. If you're working on a slightly larger piece like this, you can use your fingers, but basically it just helps to smooth out that pastel a little bit, but it also helps push that pastel into the tooth of the paper a little bit. And so what I mean by the tooth is that basically every paper that you work on has these little grooves like hills and valleys. So when you come across the top with your pastel, you're sort of... It's basically filling up the valleys until it gets level with the hills and then at that point you won't be able to add any more pastel on top because it's an even surface. It's now slick and really hard for your paper to grip onto that pastel anymore. So when you're blending your pastel, if you blend it by pushing it in with your fingers or with a cotton tip, just gently, you don't have to press too hard, sort of a light to a medium pressure. But that just sort of helps push that pastel into those little grooves of the paper a little bit and allows you to add more layers on top, which allows you to be able to make it a little bit smoother because you can keep adding the pastel on top. So here I'm actually going to blend it a little bit with my fingers. And like I was saying earlier, I'm going to keep a lot of the pastel strokes there. But if you didn't want to have the pastel strokes visible, if you wanted it to be a little bit more smooth, just add a few more layers of pastel because when you add a few more layers of pastel, it's going to become smoother and smoother and it's going to allow that uh, soft transition between each color. But if you just add a couple of layers like this, you'll be able to leave those pastel strokes visible if you want to as well. So basically the more pastel that you add, the smoother it's going to get. So I'm just gently blending this layer out. It's just going to soften those strokes just a little bit so they're not as harsh. So if you're working with pan pastel and you want to create your entire project with pan pastel or you want to complete most of your project with the pan pastel and then just come through a little bit with the pencils, I'd highly suggest working a bit larger. So this piece is quite large and I don't usually work this large with pastel, but because this piece is pretty much going to be just pan pastel with a tiny bit of pastel pencil, if you work larger, it allows you to be able to add more detail so obviously the the bigger the piece it matches the size of the soft tools that you're using so it's a little bit easier to give that perception of details when you're working larger because your tools are slightly larger than a pencil obviously so it just allows you to be able to get in a little bit smaller details in comparison to the size of the drawing whereas usually I work a little bit smaller which is why I tend to use the pastel pencils on top just because the tip of the pastel pencil is quite a bit smaller than the tools that you can use with the pan pastels. Some people also like to use makeup brushes to get some of the finer details with their pastel as well. So you can try that if you want to on smaller pieces, but I tend to just use the pastel pencils for the finer details. So I'm just going to come back through and add another layer just to give a bit more variation. So I'm just using all those same colors. So the chromium oxide green and the permanent green extra dark to start off with and I'm overlapping some of the colors that I had there previously so you don't have to put the same colors in the same spot you can vary them a little bit and then I'm also adding in some of that yellow as well just to give it a bit more vibrancy make it look a little bit brighter so when it comes to actually mixing your colors, so I was talking about earlier that you can mix colors with the, with the pan pastels. So you, there's a few different ways that you can do that. I usually just come straight into my artwork with different colors from different pans. Like I was doing earlier, picking up some of the different greens, like picking up a little bit of one green, then going straight into the other pan and picking up that green, and then just coming into my artwork. And it sort of mixes on the artwork. But you can actually mix your colors on a separate piece of paper before you go into your artwork. So I'm just going to insert some footage of how to do that. So this project was a portrait of a young girl. And sometimes when I do portraits, I prefer to mix my colors first before going into my drawing, just so that I can get a bit more of an accurate color, because I just find that's a little bit more important with portraits. So what I've got to the side here is just a piece of printer paper. So you want to try and use a paper that's quite smooth. You don't want to use anything that's too rough because the you want to be able to get that pastel off of the paper. So having a smoother surface allows you to lift that pastel a little bit more. 
So I'm basically just grabbing the colors that I think I need from the pans and you can literally mix them just like mixing paint. And then I'm making sure that that color is accurate before actually going into my drawing itself. So you can do that. You can mix your colors on a separate piece of paper if you're worried about what color is actually going to appear on your artwork. But if you know a little bit more about color theory or you're just doing a base layer for your pastel pencils, it doesn't really matter too much about getting the perfect color in the first layer anyway, in my opinion. So I usually just come straight into my artwork with the pastels straight from the pan, just because I find that it's a lot quicker rather than mixing on a separate piece of paper. But for things like portraits, for me personally, I tend to mix on a separate piece of paper just so the colors are a little bit more accurate there. You can also mix your colors straight on the pans as well. So if you're trying to mix like a green, for example, you could grab some blue and then mix it into your yellow pan and it will create a green color there, which you can use straight onto your artwork. So if you do that and you're getting green pastel in your yellow pan, don't worry about that. You can actually just grab a tissue and then just gently wipe the surface of the pan and, and it will lift up that excess pastel, which will reveal that clean color that was underneath. So I'm just continuing to add in those two different greens along with the Hansa yellow and a little bit of the yellow ochre tint towards the lighter areas. And you don't have to do the same color background if you don't want to. You can pick pretty much any color that you like. A blue or a red would look actually quite nice with this as well because there are a lot of blues and reds in the toucan. So yeah, you don't have to pick green if you don't want to. You can pick some of the colors that are already in the subject itself and then that will help make it a little bit more cohesive. So because we've already got some blues, well, we're gonna add some blues and purples and reds into the toucan itself. If you had those colors in the background, that would also look quite nice. And then again, just taking some of that permanent green extra dark and the phthalo blue extra dark just to darken up some of the areas. And I am trying to do it a little bit random like I'm not doing a giant circle around the outside I am putting slightly darker bits towards the toucan a little bit more but I am sort of generally keeping it more towards the outside of the piece to keep those darker colors around the outside and the lighter colors towards the inside Okay, so I haven't cleaned off my tool. I'm just going straight in with the yellow, the Hansa yellow, just brightening up some of those areas and it's gonna mix in with the green and blue that I had earlier. So it's not really gonna look yellow, it's gonna look more like a lime green. So I'm just brightening up some areas, giving it a bit more variation. And I'm just grabbing some white, which you can't really see, it's off the side of the screen there, but I'm just using pure white adding that a little bit more towards the toucan just to really brighten up that area right against the face there. I'm just going to take a bit more of the Hansa yellow and the chromium oxide green and just mix those two together. Just a little bit of a more yellowy green. Just add that, give some variation as well. Then I'm just gonna take some of the permanent green extra dark, just add that into some of the areas that I want to be a little bit darker. So I'm just gonna come back and forth between the colors and keep going until I like the way that the colors are placed in the dark areas and the light areas. So just taking some of that phthalo blue extra dark as well. I'm 
Okay, and then I'm going to just use my fingers again just to soften the edges. And I'm not pressing very hard at all here. I'm just trying to soften those strokes a little bit, but I'm still trying to keep that texture there. So I'm not pushing really hard because I don't want to blend out all of the colors into each other too much. And if you did want a smoother look to this, I find that if you just use a soft tool, like um, without adding more pastel to it, you can actually blend with a soft tool. So you can come over the top with a clean tool and just do circular motions over the top of it. And it kind of blends those colors a little bit more smoothly. And if you find that your it still looks a little bit more textured than you want, just add another layer of pastel over the top and then do, a, do the same thing again with the soft tool to blend it out as well. And you'll get a softer look that way. But I tend to like the textured backgrounds a little bit especially on subjects like this where it doesn't really take up a lot of the space on the paper. There's a lot of background in this piece specifically, so I like to have that textured background just to help give it a bit more interest as well. But if you did want a softer look, that's how you can do it. So I'm just going to keep going, softening out these strokes until I've done that to the entire background and then we'll come back and start on the toucan itself. Okay, so I'm just grabbing a soft tool. This is one of the knives. So you just, it comes with these little covers that you put over the top, kind of like a sock. Just be really gentle when you're doing this. I just pull down each side just a tiny little bit until it's completely on there. They do tend to rip uh, pretty easily. So just be really gentle with that one. And this one is kind of like an oval one. It has a little bit more of a point on the end. And there are a few different types of these kind of knife tools as well. So just using this one, grabbing a little bit of the Hansa yellow, and I'm going to start on the big area here. So this area that's coming down the center of the top of the beak is a little bit more of like an orangey yellow kind of color. So I'm grabbing some of that burnt sienna and I'm mixing a little bit with a yellow ochre tint as well. Just trying to create a little bit more of an orange, but not like a super bright orange. So that burnt sienna will help sort of dull down that color there. And then just to brighten it up a bit, I'm just grabbing a small touch of that permanent red and then going over the top of it with that Hansa yellow. So that obviously red and yellow make orange and that's a quite a bright orange. So I'm going over the top of the lighter colors that I had there. So it will just dull it down a little bit. So I'm sort of coming back into my pans and picking up a different amount of different colors depending on what I'm looking at in my reference photo. So you can always adjust this as you go along, just adding a little bit of white to some of this mixture as well, just to lighten up that area. This is just the base layer. I'm just trying to get in those general colors in the areas that I see them in. So I'm trying to get those yellows and oranges in the right spot and also trying to get the light areas and the midtones and darks kind of in the right spot. But we can adjust the colors as we go along as well. Just trying to put a base layer down to start with and then we can adjust it from there. So grabbing some more of that white and Hansa yellow just on the bottom part of the beak there. So the yellow ochre tint, Hansa yellow and white. So it's kind of a lighter color down here. I'm not using pure white just because if you come straight in with the white and you need to do bright highlights towards the end, then obviously you don't have anywhere to go if you started with white. So I usually start with a slightly darker color. So that way, if I want to add brighter highlights towards the end, I can do that. 
So again, just taking a little bit of those three colors coming into the bottom area here. And I'm kind of using the tip of my tool to get a little bit of a sharper point, grabbing some of that permanent red and the Hansa yellow. I'm almost mixing it on the pan before I come into the artwork there. So I'm, I only just grabbed a little small amount of that permanent red and then put it in the yellow pan. So it's picking up a lot more of that yellow because the red is a, a really bright color in comparison to that yellow. So I just want to take a touch of that red to make it just a little bit orange. And again, I'm just taking, I'm just using the tip of this soft tool. I'm not using the entire flat area of the tool because I'm working on kind of smaller areas at the moment with the colors that I'm using. So just using the tip just to get a little bit of a finer mark with my pastel. So I'm grabbing the burnt sienna tint because I can see that this lighter bit here is a little bit less yellow than some of the other lighter areas. So I'm just switching to that burnt sienna tint instead of like the yellow ochre tint and the white, for example. There's a lot of this color on the bottom part of the beak as well. And this color is looking a little bit more pink to me. So I'm grabbing a touch of that magenta, just the smallest amount. And I've just mixed it with the burnt sienna tint again. So it's just going to give it that little bit more of a pink tone to it. Just to really make it look different from the yellowy white area there. And it's only a subtle difference, but it will help with that variation and realism throughout the piece. So I'm gonna grab some of the Hansa yellow and then a touch of that permanent red again. So I just wanna make this area a little bit more of a darker, vibrant orange than what I had there before. So you can always come back and forth to different areas as you're working and adjust them as you go along. So now that I have those lighter areas in, that area that I started with in the middle looked a little bit too light. So I just gone back through and added some darker orange there. So I'm going to grab a touch of the permanent red and the burnt sienna and just come into this crease that's on the top of the beak here. It's kind of like a muddy orange color, a little bit more on the red side, but sort of a little bit brown as well. So I'm grabbing that Hansa yellow and the white and then just coming above that area there, a little bit more of that yellow. I'm just coming over the top of that crease just a little bit as well, just to blend it a little bit better. Just a bit more of that Hansa yellow there. So I'm just kind of looking at each section at a time and just seeing what colors I can see in that area. And just adding those where I can see them on my own artwork as well. And again, this is just the base layer. So I like to do the base layer over the entire subject first and then blend it all out and then add in another layer on top. Some people like to work in complete sections at a time. So they'll start with like the eye area and then they'll complete that fully and then they'll move on to the beak or the wing or a different section until it looks completely done. So, but I personally like to work in layers overall. So I'll usually do the entire base layer first and blend it all out and then add in another layer and continue to add layers that way. Just because I find that it's a little bit easier to get more cohesive colors that way. And I can also build up my values as I go along. So I make sure that my lights are light enough and my darks are dark enough throughout the process. And I find that's a little bit easier when I'm doing it in layers because, for example, if I did the eye first, if it's by itself on the toucan, I may have thought that I'd gone dark enough in that area. And then once I've done the rest of the toucan, I may realize that it wasn't as dark as it needed to be. Then I have to go back and adjust that. And I find that sometimes if you work in that one section at a time, you may have added too much pastel for your like for you to be able to correct any mistakes in case you didn't go dark enough, for example. So I just find that by working in layers, I can build up everything gradually and 
adjust my lights and darks as my layers go on against each other in the different sections of the bird as well. So hopefully that makes sense. I just find that it works a little bit easier in, in my head, but if you want to work in sections at a time and complete the beak fully, for example, before you move on to something else and then go for it, it's totally up to you, but I just find that it's a bit easier for me to work in complete layers that way. So I'm going to grab some of the burnt sienna tint as well as the permanent red. And again, just taking a tiny little bit of that permanent red, I just want to tint the burnt sienna tint a little bit more of that red pinky kind of color as well. So I'm just grabbing a little bit of that yellow as well, because I'm looking at my reference photo and just adjusting the color as I go along. So if I've laid down the color that I thought it was with this permanent red and burnt sienna, and it looks a little too pink for my liking. And then I'm just going to add in the color that I need to, to change that. So in this case, it was yellow. So I've just gone onto my toucan with the color that I thought and then added the yellow on top. It blends really nicely when you add other colors on top as well. So you don't need to worry about getting the exact right color straight away. You can add colors on top and adjust them as you go along. So I'm going to grab some of the permanent red and the Hansa yellow. I'm just creating an orange, a little bit more yellow there. And I'm just coming into this area at the bottom of the beak there. It's kind of a little bit more of a shadow on the bottom. And then it fades up into a lighter color. So I'm just starting with that shadow area on the bottom. Again, just taking a little bit more yellow. So I'm just taking a little bit of white and a touch of the Hansa yellow as well and just coming up into the top part of the bottom half of the beak there because it's quite a lot lighter than that shadow area right on the bottom there. And I'm taking the yellow ochre tint mixed with Hansa yellow. Just adding that in here as well. So I'm just going to use a mixture of those colors to create that lighter area there. The white by itself is probably too white. That's why I'm coming back through with the yellow and the yellow ochre tint. But it, the again, the color that I can see in the reference photo is a little bit lighter than the Hansa yellow and yellow ochre tint, which is why I'm adding that white in there as well occasionally. Okay, and then moving on to that little red section underneath the beak there. So I'm just grabbing that permanent red and I'm sort of mixing it in with the yellow and the colors that I've already got there to create that fade that's gonna go into that darker sort of red color there. So I'm grabbing the permanent red extra dark because it is quite a darker red. It's not as vibrant as the permanent red, like the pure permanent red. So I'm grabbing that permanent red extra dark to start with. And the highlight that's on the top of this red section is a little bit more purple. So I'm gonna grab some of that violet shade and just mix it a little bit with the white. Just because it's, it's not sort of a pinky color, it's more of a purple in that highlight area. So I'm, using the purple with the white rather than using like red with white in that area. And then before I go into the next color, I'm just grabbing some paper towel and then wiping off the excess pastel residue from my tool here, just because I went in with quite a dark sort of red color there. I'm just coming in with the white now because I don't want to mix that red too much into that area of the beak. So just adjusting the light areas a little bit more. And then as that light color fades into the shadow, I'm just grabbing a bit more of that Hansi yellow and yellow ochre tint there. Just to fade it from that sort of white color into that darker shadow underneath. So I'm looking back and forth at my reference photo and my artwork to decide if there's anything that I want to change right now with the yellow areas of the beak before I move on to a different color. So I'm going to grab a little bit more of the permanent red and Hansa yellow just to create a bit more of an orangey color and just brighten up the edge of 
this sort of darker color here. So I'm just looking for things that are standing out to me that need to be changed slightly. And again, this is just the base layer. We can alter things as we go along as well. Okay, so I'm going to take the yellow ochre tint and I'm going to come into the skin that is on the face area here. And I'm kind of doing strokes that resemble the wrinkles, like the direction of the wrinkles in that area as well, just so that it helps create that texture as the layers go on as well. So I'm following that curve of where I can see those wrinkles. So that way, instead of going up and down, for example, if any of these strokes show through towards the end, they're going in the right direction. So it's adding to that texture as I build up the layers as well. So I do that for things like fur and feathers as well. So I'm just grabbing a little bit of white there. But if I'm doing feathers or fur, I follow the direction of the fur and the feathers so that it adds to that texture and, and it just adds to that realism of the piece because if the fur was going vertical for example and you did all your strokes horizontal to start with sometimes that texture can show through especially towards the end result so you want to make sure that if you're doing an area that has really clear direction to it I tend to follow that direction throughout the entire process as well. So I'm going to use a mixture of that white and the yellow ochre tint around the eye area as well. So again, I'm just sort of using the tip of the soft tool to help create a smaller line. And again, I'm just following those wrinkles around a little bit to help with that texture there. So I'm going to grab some of the burnt sienna tint as well. So I can see a little bit less of that yellow color towards some of the areas. It just helps with that variation a little bit as well. So I'm going to grab some white. Just brighten up any of the areas that I think need to be a little bit brighter. And then I'm going to grab some phthalo blue tint because some of the eye area here has blue, especially towards the left hand side there. So I'm sort of fading that more yellowy color into the blue area by using another lighter color, which is that phthalo blue there. And then back to that yellow ochre for the bottom here. And I'm going to grab some of the ultramarine blue and I'm mixing it a little bit with the white so that it's quite a bit lighter. And then especially on the left hand side, it's a little bit darker. So I'm going to take that ultramarine blue and the phthalo blue extra dark and add some of that into the creases on the left hand side of that eye there. Again, just using the edge of my tool to do this. And taking a bit more of that ultramarine blue and the white. So I'm adjusting how much blue and how much white I'm using depending on which bit I'm working on. So if I'm working on a crease, I'm just going to use a bit more of that blue and probably the phthalo blue extra dark just to make it a bit darker. Whereas if I'm working on the lighter part, I'll use a bit more of that white in there. So like I mentioned at the beginning of the piece, the way that I usually work with pastels is that I work quite a bit smaller, probably about half this size. And then I use the pan pastels as a light base layer before going in with a few layers of pastel pencils. So in that case, I like if I'm doing it in my usual way of working, I would make sure that I'm doing a very light layer of pastel to start with with these pans. I wouldn't add as much pastel and I wouldn't go in as carefully as what I'm going in with now. So I'm just going to clean off the tool because I'm going to go into a different color. So I'm going to take some of the violet shade and the ultramarine blue 
And I'm just going to come into the darker areas of the beak and I'm going to switch it up a little bit between the blue and the purple depend depending on what I can see in my reference photo. So the lighter areas of this black area have a little bit more of a blue purple tint to it. So I'm just coming in with those colors there. But yeah, if I'm working with pastel pencils over the top of the pans, I usually come through with a few layers of pastel pencils. So I will make sure that my base layer with pan pastels is quite a lot lighter than what I'm doing here. So I only put a little bit of pastel on my base layer. So that way I can make sure that I'll still have enough tooth left in the paper to add those layers of pastel pencil. So you want to adjust how much pastel you add in your base layer, depending on how much pastel pencil you want to add on top. In this piece specifically, I'm going to basically use pan pastels for pretty much the entire thing and then just come in a little bit with the pastel pencils. So the way that I'm doing this base layer now, I'm adding a little bit more pastel than I usually would and I'm being a bit more precise about where I'm actually putting the colours and the shading and that kind of thing. So I'm just using that permanent red extra dark because I can see a bit more of a red tone in some of the beak here. Yeah, so if you want to do your entire piece with pan pastel and then you can be a little bit more precise about where you're adding your pan pastel from the start and slowly build up the layers that way and you can add more pastel when you're doing that. Whereas if you want to just use it as a base layer to speed up the process of using pastel pencils or colored pencils, for example, and then you want to add much less pastel in this layer to make sure that you can still add those pastel pencils on top. So I find that when I'm working on animals that have fur, for example, or anything that I need to have a lot of layers and texture and depth, I tend to use the pastel pencils for the last few layers to create those different layers of fur and that kind of thing. So depending on the subject that I'm working on, sometimes with smoother subjects like this bird, um, with the beak that's quite a lot smoother and not a lot of texture, like I don't need a lot of layers in the feathers and that kind of thing. I will go in with pan pastels for most of the piece, but in, in subjects like animals that have a lot of fur, for example, I will just do a light layer of the pan pastel and then I'll come through with the pastel pencils in numerous layers to build up those fur details. So if you want to actually see what I'm talking about with using less pan pastel in the base layer for your pastel pencils, because it's a little bit hard to explain, it's just better if I show you what I mean, but if you look at my YouTube channel, I have a lot of other tutorials using pan pastels and pastel pencils. So you can get a general idea of how much pastel I actually use in the base layer when I'm working with the different animals with fur and that kind of thing. So I'm just coming in with that black on the darkest part of the beak here as well. And I don't like to use black by itself, so I'm mixing in some of the violet shade and the phthalo blue extra dark as well. So the reason that I don't like to use black by itself is just because it can tend to look a little bit flat. Like when you're working with oil paints, acrylics, watercolor, most people will tell you that you need to mix a black rather than using black straight from the tube. So for example, they'll mix like ultramarine blue and burnt umber to create a really dark color that is almost black, but it sort of looks a little bit more richer than just using black straight from the tube. But I found that with drier mediums like pastel, pan pastel, um, pastel pencil or colored pencil and that kind of thing, I find that it's quite hard to mix a really dark color with other colors. So for me, I use black. I just make sure that I'm mixing in other colors with it. So I have that depth by using the black pan, but I'm also mixing in other colors to stop it from looking flat. So you'll get a lot of people that tell you that you shouldn't use black at all, but I use black all the time. I just make sure that I'm mixing in other colors so that it's not just straight black. So I haven't cleaned my soft tool between using those blues and purples and coming into this black area. So I've still got a little bit of those colors on the tool here as well. And then when it starts to look a little bit flat, I'm just gonna add in a few more of those blues and purples. So I'm just gonna grab some of that phthalo blue extra dark in this area here.
and then some ultramarine blue as well just to brighten it up a little bit So for a lot of these black areas, instead of going straight in with white for the highlights, because it can look a little dull and it just looks gray, like it doesn't look as interesting as if you used some other colors in the highlight areas. So I'm using those different reds and purples and blues to create those lighter colors rather than going straight to white or gray. And the, re the reason that I know that I can use those colors and it will look realistic is because I've I'm sort of looking at that high saturation version of the reference photo. So what I did was really brighten up those colors and exaggerated them quite a lot. And that way you can actually see that the highlights are not white or gray. They actually have a mixture of this purple and blue in there. And I find that's quite common with black areas on animals and also white areas as well. There tends to be a lot of other colors in there and blues and purples tend to be quite common in those kinds of areas as well. So. I tend to add quite a lot of blues and purples in black animals or areas of the animals that are black instead of going straight to white or grey, especially for the highlight areas. Alright, so I'm going to use a little bit of the phthalo blue tint and the Payne's grey tint. So it's sort of a lighter blue gray kind of color on the top part of the beak there and again i'm mixing in some blue with that so it's not just straight gray so that's the brightest highlight area that i can see and i'm coming through and adjusting any of the other lighter areas so this area up the top is a little bit more purple, so I've just grabbed Violet Shade with white in that area. So I'm just grabbing different colors depending on what I'm looking at in the reference photo. I'm just looking back and forth between my reference and the artwork, and I'm actually spending more time looking at my reference photo than I am looking at my own artwork, just to make sure that I'm familiarizing myself with it and all the different colors that I can see in different areas. So I'm grabbing some of that ultramarine blue and the Payne's grey tint and I'm going to come into the lighter areas of the feathers down here. So I'm going to use a mixture of the different purples and blues and also the Payne's grey tint and maybe a little bit of white in there as well. So I'm just creating a bit of variation between the different colors there. So your colors don't actually have to be exact. I'm basically following the values that I'm seeing in my reference photo. So I'm making sure that my light areas are light enough and my dark areas are dark enough. It doesn't matter too much if the shade of blue or the purple that you're using is not exactly the same as the reference photo. It really doesn't matter that much. It's more about getting your darks correct and your lights correct. I tend to exaggerate my drawings and paintings quite a lot with the colors that I'm using, but they still look realistic because I'm, I've got my values right. So I'm making sure that my dark areas are dark enough and my light areas are light enough. If you choose a blue that is not exactly the same as the reference photo, it doesn't really matter as long as it's the same value. So don't pick a blue that is too dark or too light. Just make sure that you've got one that is the same value. So if you're, wondering if your values are right a good way to check that and you can do this throughout the process so you can do it midway through your drawing or you can do it towards the end when you think you're nearly finished but if you take a photo of your artwork and you turn it into black and white and then you do the same for your reference photo turn that into black and white as well and then compare them side by side on your phone or on the computer and that way because you've taken out the aspect of the color you can actually see if your shadows are dark enough and your highlights are light enough really clearly because it's in black and white and then you can go back to your drawing and adjust them from there so that being said about not having your colors exact to the reference photo it doesn't really matter that much but making sure that you have you know the yellows in the right spot and the blues in the right spot and reds and that kind of thing making sure that they're in the right area is important but just the actual hue of that color is not that important in comparison to having the right value so now that i've blocked in those lighter areas of the black feathers here i'm coming through with some of the phthalo blue extra dark and the black 
into some of those darker areas and towards the top of the head here I can see as it looks a little bit more red so I've taken a bit of that permanent red extra dark and mixed that with the black for this area of the top here. So I'm going to switch between those blues and reds and purples in the black feathers to, depending on what I can see in the reference photo and like I was talking about earlier when I'm working on fur or feathers or anything like that, I'm making sure that I'm adding my strokes going in the same direction as the feather detail. I'm also trying to get the length of the feathers right as well. So towards the top of the head, I did a little bit shorter strokes so that it matches the shorter feathers that are in that area. Whereas towards the, like underneath the chin here and a little bit more on the neck and the body, there's longer feathers. So I'm creating longer strokes with my tool here. So that's the same when you're creating fur as well. You want to make sure that you're doing your strokes the same length as the fur detail in that area, because if you do long strokes in an area that has short fur, it can obviously make the fur look like it's longer than it actually is. And then vice versa, if you're putting short strokes on areas that have really long fur, it will make the fur look a little bit shorter. So I tend to make sure that I'm following the same direction as the feathers and then also the same length as the feathers as well. So I'm just adding some of that ultramarine blue and black just to brighten up some of these areas. And I will come back through over the top of this to darken up some of the black feathers as well and just adjust it a little bit more throughout the layering process. But I'm just starting to get that base layer in and getting that variation between the different feathers as well. So the original reference photo was quite dark and really quite dull in the black feathers. There wasn't much variation between the highlights and the shadows. So I went and edited it so that the highlights were a bit more obvious and there's more colors coming through there. And now that I'm working on the piece, I'm adding even more blues and purples and that kind of thing, just because I find that it's a lot more interesting than just having a lot of black, especially on something like this where it's quite a close up of the bird. So there's not a lot of other things going on. Like there's the different colors in the background and the beak, but if I just did the feathers almost solid black like I can see in the original reference photo it's going to look quite flat and not very interesting so by adding in these other colors in there as well it just creates a bit more interest in there. So one of the main reasons that I like working with pan pastels is because they are actually far less messy than working with pastel sticks for example because they you can control how much pastel you actually pick up and put down so Whereas if you're using a stick, it kind of, sometimes there's a lot of pastel that comes off and there's quite a lot of dust that goes with that. And I find that with the pan pastel, there is very minimal dust actually. And you also don't have to touch the pastel if you don't want to. So you don't have to blend with your fingers if you don't want to. You can use a soft tool to blend or wrap a tissue around your finger and that kind of thing. Just adding a little bit more magenta in some of the black areas as well. But yeah, you don't actually have to touch the pan pastel because you have sponges that you can work with, like these soft tools as well, where you don't physically have to touch them. So I just find that it's very clean in comparison to pastel sticks. So that's one of the main reasons that I like to use pan pastel. It's just a lot less messy. So I'm just going to switch to an even smaller soft tool. This is the one that looks a bit like an eyeshadow applicator, but it's still a soft tool but I'm coming into the eye area with black. And again, I'm just using the edges of the tool to come into those darkest areas around the outside of the eye here. Just being a little bit careful looking at my reference to make sure that I'm getting it in the right spot. And when you're working with pan pastels just by themselves like this, and you wanna get those details in, Working larger, and I talked about this earlier, but working larger allows you to give the perception of having more details. For example, if you did this on like an 8x10 piece, you're going to really struggle to get any details with the soft tools and the pan pastels. And if I'm going to work on 8x10, I tend to use the pastel pencils a lot more. But because this piece is quite a lot larger than that, 
you can actually use the edges of the soft tools because the details match the size of the soft tools in comparison to the size of the artwork. So I'm just cleaning off the excess pastel on some paper towel here. I'm going to go into that permanent red extra dark and just come into the top part of the eye here. So the top part is a little bit more in shadow than the bottom half. So I'm coming in with that darker red towards the top here. And I'm taking that burnt sienna and coming into the bottom part of the eye. And I will come through with the pastel pencils, especially in that eye area there, because it is quite small. But in general, you can get quite a lot of detail just with the pan pastels alone. But I'm just going to clean it up a little bit with the pastel pencils when we get to that. So I just grabbed a little bit of burnt sienna tint in there. Just to lighten up that bottom area and then just coming back over the top with that burnt sienna. Again, cleaning off my tool, coming into that black area and just fixing up that pupil there. Just darkening up that shadow a little bit on the top part of the eye. And then around the edge as well. And then I'm just going to clean off the tool because I'm going to go in with the permanent red and just brighten up that eye area quite a bit more because I want that attention to be on the face and the eye. So having that brighter color there will just help bring that attention there and stop it looking as dull. So I'm just going to come through and blend out this layer with my fingers. And you can use a cotton tip if you don't want to touch the pastel but I'm just gonna use my fingers for this one. If you are working with pastel pencils on top for the next few layers, and then I would really suggest using a cotton tip because I find that that pushes the pastel into the tooth of the paper a little bit more than your finger does. And that allows like more of the tooth of the paper to be available for your pencils to go on top. Whereas with the finger, it kind of softens out the colors a little bit and just blends them slightly. It doesn't push it into the paper as much as if you were using cotton tips. But in this case, I'm not gonna add heaps of layers to this. I'm only gonna be using the pan pastels and it will go over the top of this just fine for the amount of layers that I'm gonna be doing. So I'm just going through and softening out the colors and just blending them together a little bit. So one of the other reasons that I like working with pan pastels is because of the amount of control that you have over it in comparison to soft pastel sticks as well. So there's a lot of different tools that you can use, the soft tools that comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And there's also people tend to use makeup brushes a little bit. I personally don't like using the makeup brushes because I don't think that they work as well as the soft tools do, but it is an option you've got a lot of options to apply the pan pastels to the surface. Whereas when you're working with a stick, you're kind of limited to the shape of the stick. So I find that it's a lot easier to control and get into little detail areas or apply it in larger sections. There's some quite large soft tools that you can use to apply in bigger areas that saves a lot of time in comparison to using a stick as well. And also on top of that, it's a lot easier to control how much you're actually laying down. So you can do a really thin layer of pan pastel so that you can put your pastel pencils on top, or you can keep layering and create a thicker, more vibrant layer of pastel as well. Whereas with the sticks, you kind of, you don't really have a lot of choice with how much pastel you're laying down, especially if you're using those really soft sticks. So there are a lot of benefits to how well you can control these pan pastels as well. Okay, so I'm just going to come in with another layer of the pan pastel. So I'm starting out with that Hansi yellow. And you'll find that when you blend out the pastel, it does dull down the colors a little bit. But by adding more pastel, that's going to brighten up those colors. So I've, I do like to do multiple layers. You could do it all in one layer if you want to, kind of, you know, like a paint by number almost. But I like the... I like that when you have more layers, it you can see that there's more layers there. There's more depth and you can sort of see the colors that are underneath. It just creates a more realistic look and it just looks better in my opinion to have that variety in the layers that you're doing. But you can 
do all sorts of different things with the pan pastels. You don't have to work the same way that I'm working, but I tend to prefer to work in layers like this. So I'm just coming through with pretty much all the same colors that I used in the first layer. I'm just starting out with that yellow first. And one of the other things that I wanted to talk about with pan pastels is the price, because a lot of people tell me that they're too expensive, but in reality, they're actually a cheaper way to go rather than using a lot of the good quality pastel sticks, because uh, there are a lot of reasons for this, but the pans actually contain 40% more pastel than an average pastel stick, and they also yield four to five times more coverage than an average pastel stick. So the price of the pans is actually not that expensive if you compare it to a price of a pastel stick. But also on top of that, they last a really long time. Like I've had the same set of the full set of pan pastels, the 80 pans. I'm just adding some of that permanent red in as well to brighten up that area. But yeah, I've had the full set of 80 pans for probably five years now. And I do a lot of paintings like I do I use them all the time and I have not run out of any colors like I've got a white that I've been using that is probably a quarter left and that's the only one that is getting a little bit low and that's after like five years so they last a really long time especially in comparison to the pastel sticks which I find don't last that long so I'm just adding a little bit of white and I'm sort of coming up into that orangey yellow color because in the reference photo there's almost like stripes that come up from the lighter area into the yellowy area so I'm replicating that sort of texture by using the soft tool and bringing that up into those sort of striped shapes there. The other thing about the price of the pan pastels is that you actually don't need many colors to start with. So you can actually use the permanent red, Hansa yellow, ultramarine blue, and a black and a white. So those five colors, you can use that to mix pretty much any color that you need. Whereas with pastel sticks, you can't really mix them that well. It doesn't, like, it doesn't allow you to mix colors very well, which is why you see people with hundreds of different pastel sticks, because you kind of need to have every color to be able to use every color. You can't mix them as easily as you can with pan pastels. So that's a huge benefit to pan pastels. If you're starting out with pastel, you can start out with five colors and then add to your set over time if you want to, or you can purchase something like this set where it has those five colors in it, but it also has a lot of other colors that you'll use more regularly as well. So you don't have to spend as much time mixing, but you also have the ability to mix other colors that are not in the set. So in, in my opinion, pan pastels are actually a more cost-effective way to go in the long run because of all of those reasons. So I'm just continuing to use that white to lighten up any areas that need to be a little bit lighter. So I'm just grabbing that burnt sienna tint and applying that to some of the lighter areas on the bottom part of the beak, just because they're not as bright as some of the areas on the top there. If you find that you're leaning on your artwork or smudging things with your hand and that kind of thing, you can use a sheet of glassine or like tracing paper or just any normal sort of printer paper or any kind of paper you have around to rest your hand on your artwork so you just lay that piece of paper on the area that you want to rest your hand on and then you'll be able to do finer details and that kind of thing a little bit easier than trying to lift your hand up above the piece so I've got my hand lifted up I'm not pressing on the artwork at all but if you find that you are touching the artwork resting your hand on a piece of paper does help quite a bit I find that the glassine or the tracing paper doesn't tend to pick up as much pastel as um like a normal piece of paper. So if you're using a normal piece of paper, make sure that you lift up that paper and place it back down. If you're going to move it, like don't drag it across your piece in case you smudge it or anything. So for this shadow underneath the beak here, I'm using that permanent red burnt sienna and a little bit of that burnt sienna tint just to get that sort of muddy kind of orange color that I can see there. 
And I'm adding a touch more of the yellow because I can see a little bit more yellow between where that orangey kind of shadow is and then it fades up into that lighter area. There's a bit of yellow in between those two colors. And then I'm also using that on the edge of this red area here as well. So coming back through with the permanent red, I'm just going to brighten up this red area and then taking that permanent red extra dark as well. And I'm paying attention to where the darkest parts are and where the highlights are. So coming into the dark areas again, I'm taking that violet shade and the phthalo blue extra dark and a little bit of black and just coming into the darkest areas of the beak again. And because I've got those other colors underneath, I can take black and then put that over the top and it's not going to look as dull as if I just went in with black from the start. But it will help darken up those areas. I'm also just adding a little bit of texture in that crease of the beak there. There's kind of these lines or little grooves that come up from the middle of the beak there. And then I'm just going to keep coming through with the black in the darkest areas of the beak there. And then I can also come back through with those other blues and purples and reds on top of that. So when it comes to cleaning your soft tools, most of the time I just wipe off the excess pastel from my soft tool just to get rid of that residue before going into different colors or different projects. But if you find that your tools are getting really dirty and you just really want to give them a good wash, you can just use warm water and some mild soap to clean them as well. They do get stained though, so you won't be able to clean out all of the color, but the residue from the pastel will be gone. So you, you won't, it won't contaminate your other colors. It will just look like it's stained. But in general, I don't wash my tools very often. I just use the paper towel and get rid of the excess pastel on that. You can also keep a couple of tools aside for lighter colors or like white and that kind of thing that you only use for those colors if you want to. But I find that it's fine just using the paper towel. I don't really find that it's contaminating the colors too much doing that. So on the edge of the face, there's these tiny little feathers there. So I'm just doing really small strokes with the soft tool in that area just to create that texture there. So a lot of people ask me about using fixatives with pastel artwork. And for me personally, and a lot of other pastel artists, we prefer to not use fixatives in most cases because uh, there's a few problems with fixatives. Well, most fixatives is that they tend to discolor the artwork or leave little droplets or it doesn't actually fix the pastel anyway. And it's not really necessary for like if you're using pan pastels like this on the pastel mat or pastel pencils or pretty much any of the techniques that I use, it's not necessary to actually fix the pastel anyway. There's not that much dust fall off and the pastels are light fast and everything by themselves. And if you store them and frame them correctly, there's really no need, no need to use a fixative. So for me personally, I don't tend to use one. I actually store my artwork in between some acid-free tracing paper pads. So I have a few different sizes of the tracing paper pads to actually slot my artwork in between each sheet. And that way they stay flat and they're not touching any other artwork and they don't move around and rub any of the pastel or anything like that. So they stay safe that way. And I store them flat inside of a drawer. And then when you go to frame them, you want to frame them with a matting around the outside so that the artwork is not directly touching the glass. And if you store them correctly and you frame them correctly, there's no real need to use a fixative, in my opinion. So I'm just coming through with that black. And again, I'm still following the direction of the feathers. I am being a little bit more expressive, so I'm not like very definitely following each feather exactly to the reference photo. I'm just giving that general gist of the feathers, especially on this wing area here. I'm just creating the shadows and the highlights in that area. I'm not doing every single little detail.
So I'm just going to take a bit more of that ultramarine blue and just brighten up some of these colours that are throughout this black area. So another thing that I like to do with pretty much all of my artwork is to actually tape it down. So around the outside of my artwork I've got some scotch tape which is acid free tape. You can use masking tape or washi tape or anything acid free to do that but I'm just going in with some of that violet shade as well as some of those blues in the black area. But yeah, I tape my work down for a few reasons. One is that it creates a really nice clean border around the outside of the artwork. So that's really useful for framing or for moving the piece or shipping it and that kind of thing because you have something to hold on to that's not the actual pastel part of the painting. So whatever size you want your artwork to be, like if it was an 8 inch by 10 inch piece, I make sure that I cut my paper to 9 inch by 11 inch and that way I have a clean border around the outside that's about half an inch all the way around. So I'm just going to come through with my finger and soften out this layer. So you, yeah, the having that tape around the outside like that, it also looks really nice. Like if you're selling your artwork, it just gives that little bit of an extra clean look to the piece in my opinion, because I ship my work unframed because I don't really want to ship glass. So people open up the painting and it just looks a little bit nicer and neater with that border around the outside. And another thing that I recommend is that you tape it to a board or something that you can move around because when you get excess pastel dust on your painting, you can actually just pick up that board and take it to a bin and then tap off the excess dust over the top of a bin rather than like blowing it all over your desk. And then also you can actually rotate the board to get into different angles with your hand if you need to. Like if you're struggling to get fur detail going in the right direction and that kind of thing, you can just rotate the board. So there's a few reasons that I like to tape my work down. Okay, so I'm going to be going in with the pastel pencils. So this is the black Stabilo Carbothello, which is number 750. And you can use Faber-Castell Pit Pastels or Derwent Pastel Pencils or whatever pastel pencils you prefer for this. But I'm just going to come in and clean up some of the edges and some of the details with this. So I'm resting my hand on a piece of glassine for this just so that I can get a bit more control over the pencil rather than hovering my hand above the artwork. So I'm just coming into the little gap in the beak there. So they have these little sort of grooves in the edges of the beak as well. So I'm bringing that black up into the top part and the bottom part of the beak just slightly to help create a little bit of those grooves in the beak. It's not completely straight all the way down. So I'm not too worried about the amount of detail that I'm adding. I'm only adding enough detail so that when you look at it from a normal viewing distance, it adds to that realism and that texture. I'm not trying to get in every single little detail that's in my reference photo. I personally don't think it's necessary to have every little detail. And this is totally personal preference, but I... You know when you walk into a museum or an art gallery and you see those really beautiful paintings on the wall that look so realistic from a distance, but then when you get up close, they're actually, it's just a bunch of paint strokes and colours. There's not really any detail there. But when you step back, it looks realistic from a distance because the values are right and the proportions are right. It's not about the amount of detail that's in that painting. It's, it's more about the values and the proportions. So for me, I try and replicate that in my artwork. I like to have some of the pencil strokes or the pastel, sh pastel strokes showing through. And I just, I prefer that kind of look. I like to have a little bit more of my artistic style showing through and not have it exactly the same as the reference photo. So for me personally, I just take a step back from my artwork or take a picture of it and just look at it on your phone so that it looks a lot smaller on your phone screen. And if you can't really see the detail that you're adding from a couple of steps back from a normal viewing distance, and then that detail probably doesn't need to be there. The only sort of exception to that rule for me is the eye area. I tend to put in a little bit more detail towards the eyes of animals, just because that's that tends to be the focal point for a lot of animals and having that little bit of extra detail in the eye just makes it look a little bit more realistic that way. 
people tend to focus quite a lot on getting the perfect color and getting every single little hair in the right spot. And that's actually not what's making it look realistic. It's getting your proportions right and getting your shadows dark enough and your highlights light enough. That's what's going to make it look realistic. Color is important to a degree, but it's way down on the list after getting your proportions and your values right. And again, if you're not sure if your values are right, and also your proportions you can do that for, where you take a photo of your artwork and change it to black and white and then compare it side by side with your reference photo in black and white, like I was talking about earlier. You can do that at any point throughout the process. And I usually do that towards the end before I think I'm completely done, just to make any adjustments there. But you can check your proportions that way as well, because having them side by side, it kind of, it brings out any sort of imperfections and anything that needs to be changed. So I'm just going to switch to the white, which is 100, and just get in some of the highlights in the eye area here. And with that black and white comparison, I tend to do that for more difficult subjects. Like for me, that's human portraits. I find that they're really quite difficult and I have to really concentrate and make sure that my proportions and everything are correct many times throughout the process. But I find that if you actually crop in on certain sections, like just crop the eye area or just the end of the beak or the wing or whatever you're working on, if you just crop that section and then compare that section side by side with your reference photo, that can sometimes help as well with your proportions and your values if you're not quite sure by looking at the whole picture in its entirety. So just another tip there to help you with getting your values right, because that's pretty much the most important thing when working with realism. So I'm just using this white to bring out the highlighted area of the wrinkles. So because I didn't use white in the base layer, I've used some of those burnt sienna colors and just slightly darker colors than white. When you actually go over the top with the white pencil, it will show up. So I'm going through with the white to bring out that highlight on the top of the wrinkle. And I'm not being super precise with the wrinkles, like I'm not copying the reference photo exactly, but I am getting the general, the general gist of those wrinkles and making them varied. Like I'm not doing just lines in a row. I am sort of creating little wavy lines, stopping and starting at different areas. Like I am paying attention to the reference photo, but it's not exactly the same as the reference. It's not that important to get every wrinkle in the right spot. And then just coming through in between some of these feathers on the side of the face there, because those little tiny feathers are coming out from the skin. You can kind of see a little bit of that skin underneath those. And I'm just taking that white and I'm just going to bring out some of the highlights in any other areas of the bird that I think need to be cleaned up a little bit. So on the top of the beak here, I'm just cleaning up that edge just a little bit. So when you look at a bird's beak in general, there are quite a lot of imperfections because the beak sort of peels and cracks a little bit. So you get a lot of little lines and texture throughout the beak, which is what I'm adding here. So just creating some of those extra little imperfections using the white as well. And then again, creating some of that texture on this area of the beak. And I am looking at the reference photo to see whereabouts it has more of that texture and just adding it in those areas. But again, it's not exact to the reference photo. Just highlighting that edge of the beak a little bit where those little grooves are. And again, this texture comes through a little bit more in the darker areas. You can't really see it so much in the yellow areas just because it's quite a light color, but in the darker areas and that sort of red bit on the beak, you can see a little bit more texture there. So I'm just making sure that I'm adding in those little details a little bit. And 
And I'm definitely looking at my reference photo a lot more than my own artwork at the moment. So I'm really looking back and forth between my reference and my artwork to see if I can see any areas that stand out to me. I'm also going to come back through with the pan pastels just slightly at the end to bring out some reds in the background and give a bit more of an expressive look to the edges of the bird as well. So I'll come back through with the pan pastels to do that towards the end. So I'm just coming through with that black again, just defining some of these little feathers on the edge of the face a little bit. And again, I'm putting a little bit more detail around the eye area just to help bring that attention to the eye. So I'm going to take a yellow, which is 210. I'm just going to brighten up a little bit of this yellow area on the beak here. And I'm sort of using the pencil to create some lines in the yellow area of the beak as well. So I'm using that pencil to help create some of that texture there. And then while I've got this, I'm going to come into any other areas that I can see need a little bit more yellow. So on the edges of this shadow at the bottom of the beak here, just adding a touch of yellow. And I'm pressing quite lightly when I'm doing this, like I'm not pressing so hard that it's covering up the colors that are underneath. I'm almost glazing this color over different areas. So by glazing, I just mean that I'm pressing quite lightly. So I'm just switching to the 221, which is an orange, just for that eye area there. And then while I've got this, I'm going to use that in any areas that I can see orange. But yeah, I'm pressing very, very lightly. So it's just sort of tinting that color underneath or glazing over the top of the colors that are underneath. So I'm just doing it very, very lightly. And then in any areas where I want it to be a little bit more opaque or a little bit more bright and vibrant, then I'll press a little bit harder in that area. So when I was using the white and the black, I was pressing a little bit harder because I wanted it to be a darker black and a brighter highlight. Whereas with this orange, I'm sort of tinting the other colors that are underneath with it a little bit. So I'm going to take this kind of ready brown color, which is 670, and I'm going to come into some of the creases in the wrinkles on the bottom here, because it's a little bit more of a ready brown in the shadow areas of the skin that you can see. And I'm also going to come into the eye area, because there's quite a lot of this color in the iris as well. So I'm just looking back and forth at my reference to see if there's any other areas that I can see this more sort of ready brown color. I'm just applying it there while I've got this pencil in my hand. So I'm just adding a few little imperfections on the beak with this color as well. And then I'm going to take a blue, which is 425. And this is quite a vibrant blue, a little bit on the lighter side. And I'm just going to use this to bring out some of the blues that I can see, especially around the eye area and a little bit on the beak there. And then I'm actually going to take a different tool. I'm going to take a square tipped tool. I don't really know what you call it, but it's got more square edges because I want some of these pastel strokes that I'm going to do with the pan pastels to be a bit more painterly and expressive. So when you use like a square tip, it kind of gives those edges to it a little bit more than if you had a rounded tip. So I'm going to add some of this permanent red extra dark into the background a little bit because I'm looking at the piece and thinking it's looking like I want it to be a little bit more cohesive. So I'm just adding some of this red into areas in the background randomly just to bring a little bit of that red from the bird, especially that little red area on the beak and also the eye into the background to make it a little bit more cohesive looking. And I'm also going to take some ultramarine blue. Just add that a little bit in the background as well, because I've got quite a lot of blue in the bird itself. So I'm just going to add a little bit more of this in the background. 
And then I'm also going to take some of those two greens and I'm going to come from the background over the top of the edges of the toucan itself as well. So I'm sort of blurring the edges of the bird to sort of fade into the background a little bit. And by taking away some of this detail in the wing and the chest area, it helps bring that attention more towards the face as well. So I'm just using this to sort of soften the edges of the bird and create a bit more of an expressive painterly feel to it. So I'm adding in a few different colors in there as well. So I've got that phthalo blue extra dark in there, some ultramarine and some of that violet shade as well. So I'm just going back and forth between different colors that I've already used throughout the piece and just putting some of those anywhere that I feel like putting them. I'm also going to grab a little bit of that permanent red extra dark and add that in there as well. So I'm just wiping off the excess pastel on some paper towel to the side and I'm going to come in with the white and a little bit of the Hansa yellow as well. And I'm just going to come through to some of the edges of the beak here as well. So I'm going to take a little bit of the phthalo blue extra dark and the ultramarine and also a little bit of violet shade. And I'm just going to come through to a little bit more of the bird itself. So I'm just looking at the piece from a little bit further back and deciding if I want to add any more strokes in there. So now I'm just going to come through and soften out those strokes with my finger again, just so that the edges are not as harsh. And I'm trying, I'm not blending them fully. I'm just blending them enough to soften the edges and make the graininess go away just a little bit. But I want that texture to show through. I want it to look a little bit more painterly. So I'm just doing this very, very softly. So I'm just going to keep coming through to soften out the rest of this piece. And I think I'm actually going to come back and adjust where I put those lighter strokes towards the top of the beak here as well, because I think it looks a little bit too light. So I'm actually just taking that sponge that we used at the beginning and just taking some of that chromium oxide green just to darken it just slightly towards the edge of that beak there. I'm also just going to use that same tool just until I think it looks a little bit better. And I'm just grabbing some of that permanent red and deciding that I actually don't like that. So I'm going to cover that up with a little bit of chromium oxide green. And then I'm just going to fix it up a little bit. So I'm just softening this out a bit. It looks a little bit muddy now. So I'm just going to come through with the white and the chromium oxide green and I'm just gonna come over the top of that and clean up that edge a little bit. So grabbing some yellow and some green, just brightening up some of those colors a bit. And I'm just switching to the smaller tool and I'm gonna go in with that Hansa yellow on the bottom of the beak there, just to get rid of some of that gray that's there. And I might just take a little bit more of that green and a little bit of yellow I'm just adjusting any areas that I think I want to change slightly. And this is going to be totally up to you how much you want to do that. You don't actually have to add those expressive strokes afterwards if you don't want to, but I tend to like the look of the expressive strokes for something like this. And I'm just using the edge of the tool a little bit here just to give a bit more definition to some of the feathers there. I'm actually just going to come back in with that blue Carbothello, which was 425. And I'm just going to brighten up this area on the edge of the face, like around the edge of the eye here. Because I think it needs to be a little bit more blue than what I've got. So this is the point in the piece where you want to make any adjustments to your own work. So the adjustments that I'm making now, you might not need to make on your own artwork. Yours might be blue enough for your liking, or you might want to darken certain areas or lighten certain areas. So this is the point where you want to go through and change anything about your own artwork that you want to change. 
Just because I am doing something doesn't mean you need to at this point. So I'm just kind of going to come back to that white and just bring out some of the highlights that got a little bit dull. Especially around this eye area here, I really want the attention to be in this area. So bringing out the highlights and the shadows in this area will help bring that attention here a little bit more. Having that contrast there will help. And I'm just adjusting that iris in here. So there's a little bit of a lighter color just underneath the pupil there and a little bit underneath the iris. And then again, just taking that black darkening up around the edge of the eye. I'm just coming back to that brownie red color. So I'm just making little tiny adjustments here and there where I think it needs to be changed slightly. I'm just coming back to that blue and making it even more blue. So if you'd like more information about this set of pan pastels or you're interested in purchasing it, I have some more information in the description below. And if you enjoyed my teaching method and the style of my artwork, I do actually have quite a lot of real time full length tutorials just like this one on my Patreon channel. So I'll leave a link to that in the description below as well. So you can check it out if you'd like to know more about that. And if you did have a go at this project, I'd really love to see your artwork. So you can tag me on Facebook or Instagram if you like. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next tutorial.